continue in our study this morning through uh, the book of Acts, and so I invite you to open your Bible to the book of Acts, chapter number 2, and we'll be picking up in verse number 36, Acts chapter 2, and verse number 36 is where we're going to pick up. While you're turning to that, uh, I want to remind you of the context of this passage, what's taking place here. Uh, We have had the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Christ, and now we are seeing Pentecost, or the coming of the Holy Spirit. The church is born, the Apostle Peter stands up, and he gives a proclamation of the gospel, and verse number 36 is the kind of the the, uh, bottom line in his proclamation to these that are hearing him preach. So listen to the reading of God's word, Acts chapter 2, from verse number 36. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him, speaking about Jesus, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and they were, they were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Father, as we spend time in your word this morning, I pray that anything that might distract us, um, you would remove, that we would be able to concentrate fully upon your word. Lord, I pray if there be thoughts in our minds that are drawing our attention away, maybe the busyness of the day or the things we need to do, or maybe the busyness of the week we've just been through, that you would give us the ability now to set those things aside and to be very attentive to your word. I praise and I thank you for your word. Your word is truth. And Lord, I pray that you would apply it by your Holy Spirit to our hearts. Lord, we ask this morning that you again would impress upon our hearts, not just what you are revealing about yourself and your plan, but also, God, that you would give us the ability and the desire to want to do that which you would command us through your word. We pray that your Holy Spirit might empower us, that we might live in such a way that you might be exalted, that all might see that we have turned to you and that we have proclaimed you both as Lord and Christ in our lives. And this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we look through this preaching uh, of Peter through, at the time of Pentecost, I've noted various things, and so I cannot re-preach it all, but I do have some words for you so that you would remember. The first was this, that the whole sermon that the apostle Peter is preaching is a revelation of God, of Christ to the people. It's about revelation. Uh, he's revealing who Jesus was and who Jesus is, and what Jesus has done, and why he's doing it. So this revelation of Jesus is being proclaimed to the people. But instead of them receiving this revelation, they've rejected him. 
And they rejected him by placing him on a cross. And so we spoke about the revelation. We spoke about the rejection. But at the same time, we spoke about the fact that Christ was not just rejected by man through the crucifixion, but he was also resurrected by the Father. And this was a declaration of the truth that Jesus was not just a man, but that he is the God-man. 100% God, yet 100% man. That by him raising him from the dead, that he was declaring very loudly that the price paid on the cross for the sin of the world was acceptable to the Father. That the propitiation of the wrath of God was now achieved through the crucifixion of Jesus. So yes, revealed, rejected by people, resurrected by the Father, and then reigning with the Father. We spoke about his exaltation, that he's seated at the right hand of the Father right now. And then we went on to speak about the fact that he had then sent the Holy Spirit. And now we get to this point where there's the call for a response. Every gospel presentation needs to come with a, a call to respond. So let me just say this from the outset, that when we look at the response of the people this morning, that we're going to look at it in light of what has been revealed to them. Uh, it is important that the gospel be very clearly understood. There's gos a gospel, if you want to use that word, uh, the word good news is gospel. There are gospels or good news out there today that is no good news at all. There are the legalists that say you need to live in this way and, and you're able to follow these rules and you will be saved. Oh, and you can have Jesus too. And then there's the, the moralist that says um, you keep all these morals, uh, live a moralistic life and you will be saved. Oh, and, and you can have Jesus too. And then there's the ritualists. They, they're the ones that say go through these rituals and you will be saved, and, and by the way, you can have Jesus too. And there are those that are the religionists. Just follow this religion. Oh, and, and you can add Jesus to that too. I want you to understand very clearly, not only the, the response to the gospel is important, but the gospel itself to which people respond is of utmost importance. The gospel that is proclaimed here by Peter is consistent with the gospel throughout the Bible. What is that gospel? The gospel is very simple yet complex. It's simple in the sense of this, that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of our sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. That God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. The gospel is this, that there are none righteous, no, not one. And even while we were sinners, that God would demonstrate his love for us in this way that he would send his son to die for us. This is the gospel. You hear today many who say, well, we, uh, I think of a specific uh, teaching that we hear today, and it's this. People know that they're sinners. Let's not beat them with that anymore. How are you saved from sin if you're not conscious or made conscious of sin. The reality is this, you cannot be saved unless you know that you are lost, and you will never know that you're lost unless you are told so. And so those churches that say, we don't speak about sin, they have missed the gospel. Those that say, we only speak about sin, we really don't speak about mercy and grace of God, they've missed the gospel. The gospel is this, that we are sinners, and the Holy Spirit came for these three reasons in the general sense, to convict with regard to sin, the righteous standard, and the judgment to come. And so when the, pro when the gospel is proclaimed in the way that Christ would have us proclaim it, that's what should be taking place. There should be a conviction in the heart of the people with regards to sin and that there's a righteous standard and there is a judgment to come. And then they can respond accordingly. They can either reject or they can receive. They can either reject or they can receive. That is the two responses. There is no middle marker. 
So the gospel presentation is very important. And the apostle Peter here is very consistent in how he proclaims this gospel. This is not a polished sermon. This is a powerful sermon. Uh, this is a sermon that is, is Bible-based. This is a sermon that is text-driven as he takes the texts of the Bible and he applies it to the hearts of people and the Holy Spirit is convicting them. And now he comes to the end of the sermon and he says, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him, that is Jesus, both Lord, and the word kurios is used, in other words, the master or the owner, the one who is supreme and sovereign over all things, has made him both Lord and Christ. Uh, the, the Hebrew word Messiah or the Messiah is used. The one that was promised, the one that would come to save his people from their sin. Now listen to their response. Verse number 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? That when the gospel is presented and it is presented correctly, when it is presented in the sense of that it is the true gospel, the Holy Spirit takes that and he presses it upon the heart of the people. The word in some, some translations may be the word, their hearts were pricked. The reality, when you take the word that they, their heart was pierced, it has to do with the taking of a sword and piercing through. I believe that this is the word of God that is sharper than a two-edged sword that has pierced the heart of the men and women that are hearing this, this, this uh, proclamation of the gospel. Uh, it is, it's hurting. It's convicting. It's to the point where people want to, uh, are pressed to the point where they say, what shall we do? What shall we do? And the answer to that question is very important. Just as the gospel is very important, the presentation thereof, that when people respond to it through conviction, so the answer with regards to their call for help is of utmost importance. Peter could say, be circumcised. Go to every feast. Do not eat pork. He didn't say that. Now, he, he could have said, dress yourselves in sackcloth and ashes and walk around as a humble person. Go live in a monastery for the rest of your life. Do good so that one day your good will outweigh your bad. So when you get by the judgment, that your good will look a little bit better than your bad. He didn't say any of that. He said this. And Peter said to them, here it is, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This passage, and I hope you'll pay very, very close attention to all that I have to say this morning specifically with regards to this one verse. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This passage, this one verse, it has been cause for much controversy. Uh, there are denominations that are based on this one verse. They've taken this one verse and they've said, don't you see the response to the gospel that Jesus Christ came to die for our sin? The correct response for salvation is both repenting and being baptized that you might be saved. I want you to know this morning that that is a lie. That is not what this passage of Scripture is, is saying. If rightly understood and in view of the context of this passage, in view of the, the grammatical structure of this passage, in view of the rest of Scripture, that is not what this passage is saying. This passage is saying, repent that you might be saved and then be baptized in the name of Jesus, not for, uh, in the sense of, for the purpose of, 
but for because of the forgiveness of your sin. For on occasion of the forgiveness of your sin. An outward action that is speaking about an inward reality that's already taken place. So your question to me is this, right? How do you know that? So that we're going to take the whole morning and we're going to focus in on this one thing. And if we have time, we will run further. I was told to have you out by two o'clock. So, okay, I'm just kidding. So let's begin with this word repent. Repent. Repent is the, the uh, Greek word metaneo. So he first says to them, repent, metaneo, which means this, it's a change of mind or a change of purpose that issues forth in change of action. So if I had to demonstrate it in the physical sense, it would be I'm walking in this direction. For me to repent is I change my mind, I change my purpose of walking in this direction, and I change my action and I walk in this way. That's repent is to make a U-turn or to change around, to do a 180. That is what it means to repent, metaneo. You may say, but this is something that is, is new. We've never seen that. Well, you go in the Old Testament, you're going to find the, the uh, nation of Israel being called to repentance all the time. This is nothing new. You come to Jesus. Uh, well, let's begin with John the Baptist. John the Baptist comes up and he st speaks Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And he does a baptism of repentance. We have Jesus coming onto the scene. Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. You're going to find Jesus now saying this. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. Verse 15 is the gospel. The gospel is this, to repent, saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. What did Jesus say with regard to coming to Christ? Repent. Repent. Very easily he said that. In Mark chapter 6, we're going to find that Jesus is now going to send out the disciples. And they're going to go and preach the gospel. Now listen to Mark chapter 6 and verse 12. This is what the disciples were preaching as Jesus had given them instruction. So they, that is the disciples, went out and they proclaimed that the people should repent. This is the same word, metaneo, uh, to repent, to change your mind, change your purpose, change your action. The Apostle Paul, in 2 Corinthians chapter number 7, uh, we find him speaking about repentance. 2 Corinthians chapter number 7 verses 18 through, sorry, verses uh, numbers 9 through 11. As it's written, I rejoice not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief, listen to this, godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret whereas worldly grief produces death for see what eagerness this godly grief has produced in you but also what eagerness to clear yourselves what indignation what fear what longing what zeal what punishment and every point you have proved yourselves innocent in this matter godly grief leads to repentance leads to an eagerness to clear oneself, an indignation against that sin, a, 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 a fear of sin, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. You see, there's a difference in the world's repentance and biblical repentance. The world's repentance is a fear for the consequences. Oh, I'm not going to do that again. Boy, I was caught out. No, 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 that, that's not what the Bible speaks about with regard to repentance. Repentance with regards to the biblical definition speaks of this, an absolute fear for sin, not for the consequences thereof. It is, I, I, I hate what God hates, and I love what God loves. 
I've turned my, my back to the world and I've turned my heart to Christ. I have given away everything that I might surrender my life to Jesus Christ. This is repentance. This is what the Bible calls for, for salvation. Those that would teach anything different, this is a false gospel. The gospel is very clear from the Old Testament through into the New Testament. Even as far as when we get to the last book in the Bible, the book of the Revelation, Jesus writes to seven different churches, and out of seven of those churches, you're going to find five of them, him calling for something. Repent, 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 repent. You see, it's a false hope to believe that a head knowledge of Jesus Christ that's not issued forth in a heart knowledge that has changed your hand knowledge can save you. Jesus said, by their fruit you shall know them. Now, many people today, they've got the head knowledge, but it's never affected their heart. It will change their lives so that they might live for Jesus. You may be here this morning and saying, well, if it's true that I'm a sinner, if it's true that I cannot save myself, if it's true that God has made Jesus both the, the Lord or the, the Kyrios, the master, the sovereign ruler over all things, plus the Christ or the Messiah in the sense that he is the one who came to save us, that you would ask this question of me this morning, what shall I do? And you would hear me say very clearly, repent. Turn from your sin and turn your life to Jesus. You cannot have the sin and have Christ. Which leads us to the next portion of this teaching. Repentance is very clear. So is baptism then necessary for salvation? Anton, because you did not respond like Peter did. You said, repent that you might be saved. Why didn't you speak about baptism? Because baptism does not have to do with salvation. Baptism does not have to do with salvation in the sense of receiving salvation. Baptism is an outward action demonstrating an inward reality. It is a public proclamation of that which has already taken place on the inside. Well, why do you say that? Because when I read it, I read, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Why not baptism? Firstly, we as a church, and we do not believe that the Bible teaches baptismal regeneration. That's why I don't like those songs that say, I went down to the river to wash my sin away. I went to the river and I left saved. Those songs are, you'll never find us singing them because they speak of baptismal regeneration, that a person needs to be baptized in order to be saved. That is not the biblical response to the gospel. Firstly, what it's doing, if we do interpret this passage to be saying that, firstly, what we're doing is we're ignoring the immediate context of the passage. The immediate context of the passage is this. They have rejected the Christ. They have gone as far as to crucify the Christ. They have gone as far as to, to speak against him. They are, remember, these are the Jews that he is speaking to, the Jews of all nations that have come for the, the feast of the harvest or the feast of weeks. And so there are Jews all around. They are the ones that have rejected Christ. They've crucified Christ. They have denied Christ. And now he says to them, okay, you want to be saved? Repent that you might be saved and be baptized, can make a public declaration of this. In other words, uh, there's not going to be any uh, FBI. Have you ever heard of the FBI Christians? You probably haven't because they don't exist. The FBI Christians, I call them, is those that you wouldn't know that they're Christians unless they show you their badge. My experience has been not that I'm ever pulled over by a state trooper. Um, 
maybe a couple times. Okay, four times. Um, <laughs> when he comes up to the door and he pulls up behind me, I, I see the light. I know who he is. And he comes up to the door and I, I see he's got his hat on and, and typically comes with his hand on his gun when he walks up to my door. I, I know exactly who he is. He doesn't have to introduce himself to me saying, hey, I am a state trooper. I know it. You can see it. And then there was one day in 2000 and, oh, I forget the year, maybe 2006 or 7, uh, we were in the process of trying to get our, our visas to stay in the United States. And so you as a congregation did application uh, to the, um, uh, what do you call it, the immigration services. And one day there came a call on my phone and it was a man who said, I'm on my way, I'm coming from, from, from Charlotte, I need to meet you at the church. So, all right, I came immediately down here, I heard a knock on the door, I went to the door and here stands this guy in a smart business suit. I mean, this guy was dressed to the T's. I mean, he really looked like, I was thinking, hey, this may be Billy Graham's brother or something, you know? No, not until he put his hand in his pocket and he pulled out a badge and he said, these are my credentials. Uh, I am a fraud investigator uh, linked to the immigration services and, and the Federal Bureau of Investigations. And we want to make certain that uh, this is really a church and you are who you say you are. When I saw him, I didn't know who he was until he pulled out his credentials. You see, there's no such thing as invisible believers, undercover believers. That's why the Apostle Paul is here calling these to be baptized. Make it public. Secondly, if we were to interpret this passage as saying that baptism, and I think this is probably one of the strongest um, arguments, if you would, if we had to say that baptism is necessary for Scripture, we, we are going to violate a law when it comes to the interpreting of Scripture. Uh, whenever you interpret Scripture, there are certain laws that you have to keep to. One is that it's taken in context. Uh, another one would be uh, that it is taken as, as its grammatical structure. Another one is the um, understanding of analogia script, scriptura, analogia scripture, the analogy of scripture. And it's this, that scripture never contradicts scripture. Did you get that? Scripture never contradicts scripture. So if I were to say that I need people to be baptized, to be saved, that would contradict other scriptures. This is the one passage that people go to to make that argument. So show me some that it would contradict. I'm going to run through a whole lot and I've given them to James. I'm just going to read them off, this, off the screen. John chapter 1 and verse number 12 says, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Do we see baptism? No, it was those who received him. And those who believed in his name, they were given the right to be children of God. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Again, there's no um, reference to baptism. Acts chapter 16 and verse number 31 says, and they believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved you and your household, no requirement of baptism. Romans chapter 3, verses 21, all the way through to verse number 30. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus for all who believe, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace and the gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show that God's righteousness, because in His divine forbearance, He has passed over former sins. 
It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It's excluded. By, by, a, sorry, by what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Did you get that? That's a long passage, I know that. But how many times in a matter of nine verses are we told that God justifies us by faith, by placing our trust in Him, by faith, not by works? Romans chapter 4 and verse number 5. Now to one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 10. Because if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified. With the mouth one confesses and is saved. Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 9. And be, be found in him, not having a righteousness of our own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith, trusting. And then the last passage, Galatians 2, 16. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Ephesians chapter 2, let me go there. It's not one of those that I gave you, James. But in the, in the book of Ephesians, and I encourage you, if you have your Bible, to go there and pay attention to this passage. Ephesians chapter number 2, verse 4, after saying we were dead, says, But God, being rich in mercy, verse 4, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. And he raised us up with him, he seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Now verse 8, for by grace, and grace is the undeserved merit of God, by grace you have been saved, Excuse me. By grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God. Not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which he prepared beforehand that we may walk in them. So it's by what that you're saved? By grace through faith in Jesus Christ only. This is very important. Because if you're going to go to Acts chapter 2, as some have done, and said, no, it is place your trust, your faith in Christ through repentance, and now be baptized, you have nullified all these other passages. This is the principle that Scripture never contradicts Scripture. You can never base a doctrine off of one verse if you're not going to take it in its context and look at the other Thirdly, Jesus would never institute an outward ritual after he had lambasted, if you would, 
the Pharisees for their, out, their requirements of outward righteousness for salvation. Because that would give place for boasting. But we are saved by grace through faith in Christ. For what purpose? That no one might boast. And so that those who boast may boast in the Lord. Number four. Jesus is on the cross, and there's a thief with him. And the thief says to him, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus' response to this man is, Repent. Go off the cross. Be baptized that you might be saved. No, that's not what he said. He said to him, today you will be with me in paradise. Based on what? Based on his faith in Jesus. No baptism. So for us to say that baptism is required for salvation would say this, that Jesus lied. That man never went to paradise because he was never baptized. He would die on that cross. Number five. Not only is the asserting that baptism is necessary for um, salvation, uh, ignoring the immediate context, ignoring the principle of Scripture contradicts Scripture, uh, will never contradict Scripture. Jesus would never institute the, the thief on the cross. But number five, it is not true to the facts of Scripture. It's not true to the facts of Scripture. What I mean by that is this. I know of people in the book of Acts who were saved before being baptized. And there were some who were baptized but were never saved. So one of those would be the man by the name of Simon. Now, you've heard this word in Roman Catholic circles, simony, where it would be the purchasing of, of indulgences or the purchasing of grace, simony. And there's a man by the name of Simon, Simon the sorcerer, in Acts chapter number 8. In Acts chapter 8 and verses number 13, even Simon himself, this is Simon the sorcerer, believed and after being baptized, he continued on with Philip and seeing the signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. So here he's with, he's a man who's, been baptized, so we, according to what we've said, then obviously you must be saved, because if you're baptized by your salvation, or if you're self saved by your baptism, then obviously he's saved, right? Now he's seeing Philip doing all these marvelous things, and look what he does, verses 18 through 23. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of hands of the apostles, he offered them money. Now he's offering to buy the Holy Spirit saying, give me this power also so that anyone who, uh, on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter says to him, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money? You have neither part nor lot in this matter for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity or the enslavement of sin. Was he saved? No, because we know the Bible says that those who have been saved have been set free. We're no longer slaves to sin, but slaves to Christ. So there's a case of a man who, was, who believed and was baptized, but yet he was still lost. Well, what about someone being saved before baptism? Well, I believe everyone who trusts the Lord uh, is saved before baptism. That's why they're baptized. But we see it specifically in Acts chapter 10, verses 44 through 48. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed 
because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. And then Peter declared, so in other words, they are saved. They have the Spirit of God. The man with the Spirit of God is saved. So now Peter says, can anyone withhold water baptism from these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So in other words, they received the Holy Spirit before they were baptized. Hence, they were saved before point of baptism. And then lastly, you'll be saying amen. Number six, Paul's summary of the gospel does not include any baptism. Listen to what he received from the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. So here he's going to state the gospel. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sin in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas and the Twelve, and He appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen Asleep. Then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles. Last of all, to one, uh, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. As he says, "I'm here's the gospel by which you've been saved." He speaks about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and he never mentions baptism. If baptism were integral to salvation surely every time that the gospel's presented he is going to speak about the importance of baptism and this is not spoken of i've mentioned this but i'm going to mention it again finally the word ace so when we look at this passage in acts chapter 2 and i'm going to read that verse one more time to you Verse 38, Peter said to them, brothers, sorry, Peter said to them, repent, we understand what that means, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, this word for, F-O-R, is the Greek word ace, E-I-S, ace. It can be interpreted, and it is interpreted later on, about being baptized into Moses, that this word ace can mean one of specifically, I'm just going to go to three different things. It can mean be baptized for, for the purpose of the forgiveness of your sin, and that's how some have interpreted it. I believe it is one of these two, and not exclusionary, exclusionary of either of them. could mean because of, the forgiveness of your sin, for the forgiveness of your sin, because of, as a result of, the forgiveness of your sin. And the other interpretation of ace in the Greek is on occasion of, on occasion or in celebration of, for, for. So let me close out our, our session this morning with saying this. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. The wages of sin is death. What God requires, God provides through Jesus. Therefore, he sent his only begotten son that he might die on the cross for your sin, to pay the price for your sin. This is the gospel. That whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. If the Holy Spirit is impressing upon your heart, if he is piercing your heart, with regards to your personal sin, your personal need for a Savior, then you are to repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Turn from your sin and turn to Jesus. 
Give your life to Him. Surrender your life to Christ that you might be saved. You might be here and say, but I've done that. I know I'm saved, but I've never been baptized. The next step that you are to take is baptism. Not to be saved, but because you are saved. It's an outward demonstration of the inward reality. It's a public proclamation. It is a a coming out and saying, I identify with the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus. I am being baptized as a public proclamation of my, my faith in Christ. Jesus said that we are to go into all the nations and make disciples and then baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and then teach them to obey. So from their response, there's the reception those that responded in repentance, they were then baptized and placed in to the church. 3,000, according to this passage, were saved on that day. Next week, we'll pick up in verse number 42. Father, I want to thank you for the time we've had, and I thank you, Lord, even though this has been a rather intellectual pursuit this morning, that you would seal the truths that we've heard that it's only because of your grace that we're saved. There's nothing that we can do, not baptism, not confessional, not not the Lord's Supper, not anything like that that we could do to earn our salvation. But that we are saved purely because of the fact that you have chosen to call us to yourself, that you have chosen to die to pay the price for our sin, and you are the one that's calling us into your kingdom. Lord, I pray that if there be anyone in this room that has not trusted you as Lord and Savior, that God, they might be pierced to the heart, that they may respond in repentance and be saved, and Lord, that they too then may be baptized and come into the the family, uh, local family uh, at Lake Lure Baptist Church. I thank you for each one that's here. Lord, I pray that you will continue to complete the work that you have begun in us because it's you who works both to work and to will in our lives. Make us very sensitive to the leading of your Holy Spirit. Help us to be obedient in our walk with you, not to get saved, but because we've already trusted you, because we're saved. So Lord, I'm so thankful for the fact that there's nothing that I could do to earn my salvation. And I will praise you because that which you have demanded, complete righteousness and the price of death, you have provided through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the fact that Jesus is enough. And this I pray in his mighty name.